Yeah, sorry, I'm preempting item one. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> wait for it, Sam. Wait for it. Okay, so so um, just to you know the old uh, basic housekeeping. Can you please mute when you're not speaking, so it'll, it'll help the um, audio of the meeting. Help us all hear each other a bit better. And um, and if you want to ask a question, if you can raise it, ra use the raise my hand function. That would be really useful. Or if not, put something in the in the chat that you want to ask a question. Um, or um, alternatively, we'll give you a chance throughout the meeting to, to speak. Um, you know, if you're not able to do those things. Um, okay. So we ready to start. Um, so any apologies, Sam? Thank you, Chair. Apologies from Councillor Murray, uh, Councillor Bond, substituting. Thanks. Thanks very much. Have you got any points? No, no, no further no. apologies. Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to go on to approve as a correct record the minutes held of the meeting held on the 7th of September. Has anybody got anything um, to raise? Can't see any hands at the moment. Am I taking that as everybody's happy? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, Helen, that's the proof. Thank you. Hey. Uh next point. So the declaration of interest. Is anybody does anybody want to declare an interest at today's meeting? Rachel, Councillor. Uh, I think it it's known. But yeah. uh, I am actually married to, to Councillor Ellis. Yeah. OK. Thanks for uh, flagging that. Um, OK, are we moving on to portfolio holders? Helen, did we have to go through who's here? Um, I think we all, we can all see who's here, can't we? I can go through it if you like, but um, I think everybody's present apart from... Um, Councillor Thomas, Councillor Holloway, Holloway, Hemingway, Hemingway, <laughs> Hemingway, <laughs> Councillor Hemingway. Um, but everybody else, uh, I believe, is present. OK, brilliant. OK, so we'll move on to um, we'll move on to Councillor David Ellis, who's here as the portfolio holder for um, public protection. Uh, yeah, so if you'd like to um, take it away, David. Thank you, and thank you very much for, for inviting me. Uh, as you've heard, uh, I'm accompanied by Sam Palmer, who's the Food and Private Sector Housing Manager, and David Jane, who's the Community Safety Manager. So if there are any tricky questions, uh, they'll come on and, 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 and answer them. I circulated some slides just to, uh, just to help go, th go through this. Um, you may or may not want to, to see them on the screen, but uh, there they are. Uh, yes, so, so if we move on to the next screen, I feel I feel like Chris Whitty. Next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, essentially, this is this is, these are the areas of the portfolio you've seen the screen before. Um, so these are the the, the main areas um, of, of my responsibilities. Moving to the next screen, the next slide shows the the areas I thought we needed to to cover. Uh, Crime and antisocial behaviour, of, of course, as, as usual, and particularly the effect of COVID-19. Uh, as part of that, I, I want to pick out uh, domestic abuse and uh, some work that the PCC's office has done. And then uh, want to update uh, members on the proposals for phase two selective licensing. And then uh, any other issues raised by members. I've, I've had a couple that I'll, I'll pick up on. Yeah. So the next screen shows the... The, the, what's happening to crime and antisocial behaviour. This is taken from the uh, police and commissioner, police and crime commissioners annual report. So this is data as of um, the end of uh, end of March. So it's it's the last last year, and you can see there uh, that there's been a, a downturn in lots of areas of of crime. All crimes, more or less, more or less static. 
but you'll see that uh, thefts down, hate incidents were down, ve vehicle crimes were down. This, this is across Nottinghamshire. Um, and then the next screen shows you areas where where offences have, have increased, and this is largely response a result of, of, of proactive policing. Uh, they, so we've seen the success of Operation Reacher and increasing the, the response teams. So you see there's been a, a significant increase in the level of stop and search. Uh, drug offences, which by their very nature uh, are, not, are generally not known until they're detected, also increase in possession of weapons and public order offences. I said this was until until March. The next slide, which you've seen before, sh shows that which I bring every every year compares the different ways of measuring crime. And uh, we, as we've discussed in the past, that the two main ways of measuring crime are recorded crime recorded by the police and the uh, the Crime Survey for England and Wales. So you see the box at the bottom show the recorded crime, and you see continue to decline until 2013-14, uh, but it's been on a, a steady increase since then. And the the blue line there shows you the the Crime Survey of England and Wales, which is as it, as it says, it's a survey of the population and people who've been asking people if they've been victim. And again, you can see that that's, that declined until 2014-15 and is a steady-ish decline there. The top line with the diamonds, uh, the nature of the, the survey is it doesn't pick up things like fraud and cybercrime, which are becoming an increasing proportion of, of crimes generally. So you'll see that's a forecast from the ONS of if we if we include include that. I see Mike's raised his hand. I was just going to say, David, do you want to do you want if you happy, could, happy, happy, happy to take questions yes. as, they, as they come along? Yeah. So if you spot oh. somebody putting their hand up, great. Go on, Mike. Uh, hang on, is my mic on? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. That's okay. Um, now, now I just I just wondered. Um, what the year is, you know, you know where it says 2019-2020, is that sort of December 2019 to December 2020 or? No, yeah. no, what, it's, it's, it's April, April, April to March. It's a, it's a financial year. It's a financial year. OK, that, that's fine. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. OK, so that's that's the picture across the uh, uh, across the uh, the force area. Oh, hang on, the Michael next... Boyle's got a question Sorry. as well. Sorry, David. I didn't, I didn't see that one. Yep. You're on mute, Michael. Sorry, David, for interrupting your flow, but I thought I'd get it in before you really got started again. So sorry about that. But um, thanks, Chair, for bringing me in. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. One relates to a slide which is later on in your presentation, which I can ask, ask now if you wish. And, why, and the other one is, is on the um, proactive policing slide that you had a few moments ago. I noticed on that one, although it's up to up to March of this year, I believe, um, that's having stop and search up 78.7%, which is an awful, awfully big figure. Uh, one, is there a breakdown in racial uh, uh, groups on that, um, on that, on that stat anywhere? And also, the second question related to that is, why is it quite such a large increase? Is it from a very low base, or is it, um, or is it really, or is really that something's going on here that we need to be aware of? And the second question I have, which is in relation to your local policing priorities slide, which you're, you're going to go and come to, uh, is uh, one of them is is speeding and whether. Uh, there is any coordination between what you're reporting there on, on on speeding and and traffic calming measures that we might do, particularly on trunk roads like like on Mapley Top, which I know is an issue. Well, I'll come to the second one when I come to that slide. Um, the first one, the stop and search. It's a result of, as, it, as the slide says, proactive uh, policing. So concerns, as, as we know, there's been concerns across Nottinghamshire uh, about the prevalence of, uh, of knife crime. 
um, and the prevalence of drugs. Most of those stops and searches are actually drugs related rather than uh, rather than uh, offensive weapons. And I haven't got a breakdown by by racial groups. We did ask the uh, the, uh, the police and crime panel. We did ask the commissioner and the, and the chief constable, and they were they were clear that it's it's intelligence led, um, and they have a, a a relatively high success rate. Something that uh, both the commissioner and the police and crime panel monitor to make sure it doesn't get uh, get out of hand. So if we can move on to the next slide, which brings the picture more locally. And it's this, this is recorded crime in Gedling. So this compares the six months to September 2020 to the six months to March 2020. And if, if you look at the, the offences above the grey line, so you'll see the effect of COVID, you know, a massive drop in all crime, well, significant drop in all crime, in victim-based crime, in violence, in thefts and shoplifting, in vehicle offences. Larger to just because shops were closed, people were at home, so there was very less opportunity for uh, for people to, uh, to 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 commit crimes. But obviously, that was a that was a particular moment in time, and not really something you can. Uh, used to, to to project much much forward from that below the line that's information on year to date which again was to the end of september compared to the same period in 2019 and so you can see there's been a a significant increase in antisocial behavior reported to the police and we know that that's predominantly uh, around covid so that's mm -hmm. uh, pe people reporting other people for uh, uh, not so, not um, socially distancing, uh, for parties and and stuff and stuff like that. Uh, relatively minor increase in um, hate occurrences, only nine, which is you know, give an area we thought might be a risk. Uh, and an increase of uh, of ten percent on domestic occurrences. And then moving on to the next slide, which sets out the local policing. Pro oh, sorry, I put I put a new one in. So this is this is to answer the uh, uh, the chair's question. You asked about the comparison between the different areas, um, and these the difficulty in getting some of the information is not directly comparable. If you look at the top block, that there are the three community safety partnerships in the in the county. So South Nottinghamshire, which is Kedling, Rushcliffe and Broxtow, Mansfield and Ashfield, and the uh, Barcelona, Newark and Sherwood. So you see there, uh, this the figures, comparative figures for the last full year, that's 2019, 2020, mm -hmm. and you'd see um, there that um, South Nottinghamshire it was, didn't have a significant increase, but there was a there was an increase, uh, and certainly compared to the other the other two, uh, again victim based crimes, there was an increase at uh, Mansfield, Ashfield, and and the others showed uh, a, a reduction. Mm -hmm. So this, it's with all these, it's uh, it's a uh, uh, limited as to how much how much the the, the value is of the of the comparisons because um, you are talking about very different areas and in many cases very different uh, baselines. Um, mm -hmm. The block below the bottom, the bottom shows the three boroughs in South Nottinghamshire uh, CSP, and again that's that's year to date, and that was to the end of October. So you can see there um, a significant reduction in all crime yeah. um, and an increase in, in ASB. It, David, this I is, can see we've got a hand up, sorry. OK, yeah. I think it's, oh, we've got two. So we'll have Councillor Hope first and then Councillor 
Sam Smith. Yeah, yeah just, just, just a small point. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually going back to your uh, recorded grime in Gebling um, slide first. That's when I put my hand up, but I've got two questions now. Um, one is, um, I, I can see that we're recording reductions in crime, and yet um, I do know that inside the community of Calverton, um, that there's a general feeling that although the statistics for the whole of Gedling don't reflect it. There has been increasing burglaries and, and more particularly theft from sheds, etc., and garages. Um, and, and, and I seem to record reading that. I, I couldn't find it today when I went back to try and find it, but I seem to recall reading that that was the case um, in, in the police figures that were circulated. Um, it, the, 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 I, I know that this is Gedlingborough and therefore you're dealing with Gedling as a whole. Um, but, but what efforts are made by the, the, the borough to say, well, hang on, um, whilst overall we're doing quite well, that area seems poor um, or worse. Um, what resources can we move in to, to, to combat that? Well, you have to remember, of course, that... Uh, Responsibility for dealing with this is a is a policing responsibility rather than a, a, a borough council responsibility in itself. But no, the Chris Pearson uh, review every day reviews crimes, and if you talk to him, he does know what's going on. And certainly, he highlighted that there are issues in 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 Calverton um, around uh, burglaries and sheds, and they and they do alter their their patrolling patterns to to respond to this the fact that we've got the uh the, the local operation reach team means that rather than people being locked into patterns of the neighborhood, neighborhood um, patrolling patterns he can he can decide that using the intelligence he's got that he will move so if there are crimes happening in calverton on a, a friday or a saturday night he'll put the uh, the Reacher team in on a Friday and Saturday night rather than using them in Arnold on a, on a, on a Monday morning. So we, I think I'm confident that they, they do respond. Uh, and in fact, it, I find it fascinating that if you ask him, Chris Pearson probably knows who the, who the perpetrators are. Yeah, uh, I, I do. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not just Calverton. It's, it's, uh, uh, Crime levels are relatively low, and one or two people can make a big difference. And you yeah. know, the, the, well, in the discussions I have with Chris, he says, "Ah, so and so's coming out of of prison uh, next week, so we expect something to happen in 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 in, in the yeah. areas." So yeah, so yes, we do. Uh, the police are, are are on top of that that sort of thing. Did you have can, another can question, Mike? Can, 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 can I just ask my second question? Because it's on the slide that's on the screen now. Then I'll shut okay. up. Okay. Um, if SNCSP stands for Gedling, Brockstone, Rushcliffe, how can all crime at the top be plus 2.6 and all crime at the bottom be down in all three areas? That because we, because I, I, I think I explained, we're looking at different uh, time periods. The one oh, at the top oh, is, is the full year 2019-20, and the one at the bottom is the uh, uh, the, the last uh, six or seven months, year okay. to date. Need a mathematician on this, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, desi okay. it's designed to confuse, it confuses me. <laughs> okay. Councillor Sam Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, David, antisocial behaviour is obviously on the rise across the borough, and it's something that's coming into my inbox more and more. Um, and the council can support the police on that, with such as installing cameras, which you've done on Rolleston Drive and Mapley Top, etc. Um, is there anything more that your department's looking at doing to support the police in tackling that? I think I, the thing about antisocial behaviour is it covers a whole whole range of of uh, uh, of issues. I mean, this, I think that it's a little bit distorted for the last few months because I say most of the, most of the ASB reports, uh, both locally 
and uh, well, both locally and across the force and nationally, uh, are down to to COVID, uh, and people report complaints of COVID. So things we do, we have uh, we have the antisocial behaviour officer. So if we're talking about neighbour uh, disputes, noisy neighbours, stuff like that, we can deploy the uh, uh, the various resources we've got to deal to deal with that. If we're talking about antisocial behaviour in parks. Uh, that we can deploy the the neighbourhood the neighbourhood wardens. Um, is there a particular issue you're thinking of for antisocial behaviour? Particular type of antisocial behaviour? Yeah, just in Trent Valley, it's um, like school primary school age or just second you know the first year of secondary school age children on parks etc. And I know parish councils spend a lot of money investing in great parks for them to be trashed at night by these. People yeah. and um, the yeah. local policing officers uh, are really supportive. But um, I wondered if anything more could be done in that, from our council point of view to help tackle it. As I say, we the, the, we work with the police, so the the police could be patrolling, the wardens could be patrolling, could, could use the um, particularly if it's, if they're into uh, uh, secondary school, use the school liaison officers to try and uh, get get the message message across if it's sufficiently serious then uh, cctv would be a would be a, a possibility yeah. okay i'll hang on i think uh, david jane was talking yes in. david jane Yes, hi, good evening. Um, just to, to add to that as well, is that one of the, the key pieces of work that uh, we've got on at the moment, and we have been doing for the past 18 months actually, is um, you, we have the police resources working jointly with neighbourhood wardens, but it's also with um, youth justice services, youth services outreach, uh, with the uh, community sector provider of youth service provision. Um, so that's, you know, th this, some of this is actually funded work externally through the Police and Crime Commissioners funds and some of it has been stumped up by the County Council to do some work. Some of it is around particular knife crime issues, but other is just general antisocial behaviour um, issues and it's about deploying resources at the right time in the right place. And this goes back to, to what Councillor Alex was saying around um, the, the working with the police because they get the reports he looks at those on a daily basis and then we have a, a fortnightly meeting, but actually we can do, deploy stuff uh, uh, almost uh, uh, overnight into those areas where, where we need to target where the problems are actually arising. So um, it is quite a, a broad piece of partnership work that we do. OK, I've got Brilliant. Thank you for that. S sorry, Sam, I've got Councillor Hope again. C can I speak? Yes, yes, please. Go yeah, ahead. right. Um, just following on from everything that's been said, we've got three three parks with swings in them in, in Calverton. Two of those parks have been shut now for months. Um, the, the, the James Seeley Park, um, the Borough Council agreed and, and the parish councillors um, supported it. Um, I, I was going to put some of, some of my money in towards it to, to repair it. Um, and they did repair it, and the night before it was due to open, it was wrecked again. So it's 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 remained closed ever since. The the the, the park on the Brambles, which is also a well used park, um, has has been closed for quite a long time now because of vandalism. And and again, I note, yeah, you know, I'm I'm not being really hypercritical. I'm just wondering what the solution is. Um, I note that Gedding Borough has said that the um, sill money. From the the um, the houses on the, the the bungalows that are going on North Green will be directed towards that, which is, which is good. But but the problem is, um, what what can we do to stop this this continual sort of circle of um, the borough with support of the community repairs? The vandals come in and destroy, and then it's closed for another three or four months because that 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 is being felt you know, by the community, and I'm sure it's happening in other areas. But can we not break this cycle? I mean, how, how could, for example, um, Calverton Parish Council um, get um, surveillance on a park just to see who is exactly is doing it? Although I do agree with. Um, David, but probably the police know already. But 
you know, it, because it, 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 it's, it's beginning to get people really quite angry, particularly in a period of lockdown when you know, taking your kids to the park is probably something that you really do need to do, you know, give, give them the situation. I think yeah, if you had the, the solution to this, Mike, you can make a you can make a fortune. I mean, I've got every sympathy with that. Uh, in Arnold Arnold Hill Park, we we spent was it? Uh, I can't remember. Where it was eighty or ninety thousand on on re refurbishing the park, and uh, only a few months after it been open, somebody torched the uh, the, the tower. Yeah. In in another one in 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 in, in my ward, uh, George V on Hallam's Lane. Again, somebody set fire to the to the rope swing the issue is to my mind you get hundreds of people who enjoy it but given those two examples you only needed two people in each yeah. case to 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 uh, to destroy it um and other than other than lo locking them up with with high gates uh or having a the old fashioned parky on 24 hours a, a day um I struggle to find how you would how you would stop that. Uh, it, we've got CCTV on Arnett Hill, uh, a, uh, which helped us identify the the perpetrators, but the time didn't stop them, uh, as I said, torching the tower. Yeah, I, I understand. Th I mean, thanks for that. I'm just just getting it off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we move on? Chair? Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Please do. So I think the next slide should be the local policing priorities. If you're not, yeah, uh, you know because I, I I write to you regularly that uh, we have a, a a quarterly meeting. I have a quarterly meeting with the uh, local policing inspector, in which we review the policing priorities. And the input to that is the information that I have and the views that uh, members feed feed into me about that the there's a, a regular survey of the of the public um and of course uh, chris pearson say his his understanding of crime in the area and and intelligence uh, these are the current uh, priorities um and speeding uh is one that is is particularly of uh, concern to to the public uh we we get it fairly fairly regularly uh, as as an issue, um, and that's one that uh, Chris has, has picked up on, and he's he's deploying the the, the specials uh, to, on uh, weekends to do uh, uh, speed um, speed tra tracking. He's he's talking to a couple of uh, custody sergeants who need to do a community project about doing a, a local speeding project in 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 Gedling. Um, and I know you'll have seen they've been out in, in places like Ravenshead um, and in, in Red Hill areas that we're highlighting. I've, I've highlighted a, a couple to, to them that they'll, they'll pick up on. So that's the sort of thing. If there are particular areas that people are, are, are concerned about, then um, let, us, let, us, let us know. Uh, to answer Ma uh, Michael Boyle's question, of course, highway is responsible, the responsibility of the County Council. So if uh, if, there's, if they want to put uh, traffic calming in, that's the county council responsibility. In most places, uh, from experience, there's as much opposition to traffic calming as there is support to it. The other two areas we've talked about the, the burglaries in, in Calverton. I mean, it's not just in Calverton, but obviously burglary is a is a serious uh, as a serious consequence on on people. And drug supply is one that uh, I do get members. Uh, reporting uh, that there are areas where drug dealing appears to be going on. Uh, part of the, con the concern about that is, of course, that drug dealing underpins a lot of other crime, whether it's burglary, whether it's uh, shoplifting um, or, or violent crime. So they're, they're the current policing priorities. So they're, they're reviewed every, uh, every three months. So that's just a, 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 a quick tour around the sort of the crime, uh, crime trends and, and, and local local priorities. One of the areas that we were all concerned about uh, during lockdown is the consequence of um, 
of for, on, for domestic violence on people being um, victims and perpetrators being 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 locked up and and the, and the tensions that would that would that would grow there and the effect that that would have on people. So if we look at the next slide, so I just thought it'd be worth having a. a a, a brief discussion on 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 domestic violence and and, and abuse, and uh, you see the sla the uh, document there is something that the the uh, police and crime commissioners office have produced on trying to improve the response to domestic violence. Um, I suppose it's worth saying that there is no offence of domestic violence and abuse, other than stalking or har harassment, but uh, there are other crimes, other incidents that have a domestic component that the police flag up as, as a domestic incident. So the thing of the, the, the changing, changing nature, um, there seems to be fewer physical injuries uh, as, as a result of domestic abuse or few domestic violence crimes, um, but there's more, if you like, more subtle areas. So there's more around coercive control is more more about stalking um, increasing trend on, on parental abuse so a lot of this is is is, is the changing nature of, of society and the changing nature of, of technology so stalking happening online which it you know it, it didn't do before everybody had the internet and and uh, uh, smartphones and were able to uh, to track where people people were going one thing that we've been concerned about at the police and crime panel is, is whether the, the level of domestic violence, domestic abuse is actually increasing. We get regular reports from the uh, commissioner reporting that there has been an increase in the level of uh, domestic abuse, which is a good thing because we're seeing more of it. So we, we, we did challenge the commissioner, which is what led to the that the 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 document is produced about whether it was the icebergs growing uh, or whether we're seeing more of it and they're pretty clear they, they, that both the commissioner and the chief constable that uh, we're actually the iceberg isn't getting significantly bigger we're just seeing more of it so in this case rep uh, increasing reported crime is a is a good is a good move domestic abuse has been a has been a, a priority for the commissioner uh, it's been in each of the police and crime panels since he was elected in, in 20, 2012. Um, and it's, a, it's a shared by the the, uh, um, the community safety partnership and by the, all the various various partners. Um, as I mentioned, the concern about, about lockdown, um, which, which there's been uh, some increase, but uh, not as... as, as significantly as we as we feared at the bottom i mentioned the uh, domestic um domestic violence bill which has received its, th its third reading in the commons is now in the in the lords uh I mean, some members will be more aware of it than i am but it's uh, it is going to make a significant change to the law introduces a, a new domestic abuse commissioner uh a new facility for protection notices and protection uh, to which can conditions which can secure pe people it pro provides a duty on local authorities to provide support to victims of domestic abuse and their children in refugees and other safe accommodation this is a duty that's going to be effective on the upper tier authorities uh, but local uh, district councils will have a duty to to cooperate with them so it could make a, a significant impact on the provision for domestic uh, victims and survivors of domestic abuse. I'm just just looking at the, 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 the stats in the level of uh, of, of uh, domestic violence. The number of reported incidents actually reduced during the initial phases of, of lockdown. Um, but then as, re as restrictions were lifted, reports increased by about 11 percent uh, there's been an increase both nationally and locally with calls to uh, to helplines 
as part of the police's response, uh, they, they proactively contacted all medium and low risk known victims. And uh, in, in Gedling, police officers visited all high risk victims to uh, l let them know that uh, the, the support was available. And uh, if the perpetrators were, were around, uh, so they could see that uh, the police were monitoring the, this. And the, the police imp implemented the, the silent calls protocol. Uh, so if, uh, if somebody rang, they didn't need to speak, they could, they could, write, they could uh, press five twice and it would go through to the control room and they'd know that somebody was on the phone but couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, speak. Um, the commissioner increased the, the support, the financial support to the agencies uh, and improved their, their, their technology because the support agencies are working remotely um, and they needed support in, in getting in getting that uh, up and up and running. Um, domestic abuse cases are dealt with uh, through the multi-agency risk, assess risk assessment conferences, uh, the MARICs, who that discuss high risk cases and, and coordinate them. Um, and that's something that uh, David Jane uh, is involved in. So if you need uh, detail on that, he's, he's your man. Um, so, one particular thing I would highlight is that uh, we took the initiative, or David Jane took the initiative, to streamline the sanctuary scheme. The, the scheme uh, provides additional security at victims, at victims' homes. And typically, prior to lockdown, it was taking uh, several weeks to uh, to deal with with uh, particular any referrals. Um, he, he, he streamlined that. And, and it's down to, uh, to two to three weeks. So if somebody reports something, we can get them their, their house secured relatively, relatively quickly. So if we move on to the next slide. So essentially the, the uh, document from the commissioner's office uh, is around improving the response to domestic violence looking at it across the, the whole systemic view across the whole board. So uh, the these are the conclusions from the um, from the, the, the document that the prevalence and the severity of uh, domestic abuse is declining. Um, that on that they're on the on the things we can measure. Um, but there's, there aren't any measures yet on coercive control, on honour-based violence or, or forced marriage. So uh, still, we, still some work needs to be done, done on that. In terms of victims, we mean 67% uh, of victims, uh, which well, roughly means that they're, they're twice as likely to be victims as, uh, uh, as men. Um, about 40% of the victims reported having children prevalent uh, present in the in households um, and about half the children saw or heard the abuse and we know that uh, a history of domestic violence in the house in the household and exposure to it increases the risk of physical and emotional health and health problems uh, later on I mentioned earlier on that uh, there's no crime of domestic violence but it's something that uh, needs to be recognised and to be, be flagged and more incidents are being flagged by the police as um, as domestic violence and that's down to improvements in recording standards and, and better training and the police has got two specialist honour-based police honour-based crime police officers. Prosecution rates are, are a concern um, the starting point here, of course, is that many survivors don't report uh, to to, uh, to the police and don't seek an uh, uh, answer through the criminal justice system. So the, the, the report highlights that uh, it's the first response that's, in, that's critical, that uh, police officers who identify uh, domestic violence need to, again, protect the victims and prevent future harm and secure secure the evidence and the reports 
very much talking about needing to um, develop to collect their own evidence rather than relying on on this on the statements of a, of a victim. Um, the proportion of domestic abuse cases that achieve a positive outcome is is about thirteen percent, which is consistent with the East Midlands and fractionally higher than than England and and, and Wales. Uh, CPS they their legal decisions lead to lead to a charge in about seventy three percent of cases and a conviction rate in about seventy eight percent. But obviously the effect of COVID has been to reduce the 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 rate of uh, cases being processed by court, although we're told that courts are giving um, giving priority to domestic advice. Nottinghamshire, the, the report highlights in Nottinghamshire, we've got uh, uh, quite an extensive network of advice agencies that are funded by the PCC and the city and the county county council. Refuge funding is is. is it's short term funding. We've got uh, currently 77 units and the estimate is that something like 80 percent of, of what's what's needed. So there's pressure on the um, on refuge places. The automatic perpetrators, the report highlights the limited provision for behaviour change uh, for perpetrators and a lack of evidence really of, about what works increasingly putting more emphasis on on healthy relationships, particularly bringing that into into schools. Um, the prevention preventive services, domestic violence, like many other services, operates with the, the public health approach. So you've got three tiers, you have the universal services. So that's the sort of education, working with schools, grassroots organisations. Secondary prevention for those who are at risk. Uh, of, of domestic violence and, and tertiary working with those who are affected to try and minimise the effects of them. And the 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 VRU is 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 got some work doing some work on uh, domestic violence and, and knife crime. Oh, sorry, Mike, have you got your hand up? Sorry, uh, yes, I have. I, 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 it, it's not a big one, but sorry, it, it was the figures there. Um, you're saying that there, there, there's a problem over refuge crisis, mm -hmm. and, and then you said we've got 77 places, which the, is roughly 80 percent of what we need. Now, this is this is just to be clear, Mike. This is this is across the county. Yeah. Well, what, what I'm getting at is surely, you know, I, I hate to say it, but you know, to to, to increase 77 to 100 percent. Uh, means that that you only need another twenty places. For God's sake, can we can we not find? I mean, that is one thing we could probably solve. Can we not find some way of finding another twenty or thirty places uh, of refuge, um, which would then mean that you're coming to us and saying, well, we you know we've got ninety or a hundred places, which is all of what we need with a few to spare. Um, you know that. That there aren't many things in this area that you can do that are very easy, but but that seems to me one that is. Yeah, it's in interesting. Um, most of the funding is is government funding; it's short term funding. <laughs> so yeah. so it's it's a lot of uh, well, short short term and all the all the problems with short term short term funding, and it's it's dealt with as a. a the county council leads on on uh, refuge places. Now it might be that when the uh, the, the the bill comes in and increases imposes a duty, the government will have to find new funding for it's the the new burdens uh, regime to to increase it. But uh, well, we can but hope. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Oh, hang on. Somebody else got their hand up. Uh, Jennifer. Yes, that would be me. Um, I had a quick question regarding um, the work that's being done. You spoke about the things around healthy relationships, which I'm very, very pleased to see more of. But I was curious if there are any um, 
anything is there anything in place gathering data regarding the efficacy of that so can we get anything oh even if it's just a correlation of places where we have that in place and if it appears to be reducing um any incidents of domestic violence especially involving young people i would be i would be very mm. surprised if we had that yet um, considering that we haven't been doing it that long, but if there was anything in place to gather that data for future, um, I think I think you're right. I don't think I don't think that that data is is available is available yet. Um, and of course, it's, it's some of it's there's the thing about universal services, isn't it? Some of it's so long term, you, it's hard to judge whether whether something hasn't happened. Um, but I would I would hope that it is being. I was, I was just looking through the uh, through the the report and see if there is anything on on that. Certainly, the the services are, are confident that it will it will it will work. But there's certainly there's also an issue of um, younger people getting more involved in in uh, domestic abuse, which is you know it's an abuse in it's defined as abuse in a relationship so it's not let's say if you like in in a, in a household so you are increasingly finding uh, abuse with uh, affecting younger younger people mm. anything more on on domestic violence or we, we, it, it is a it is a big a big issue uh and so the 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 report fairly comprehensive 77 page report from the the commissioner so they're working on the consultation closes this week um and then the the commissioner will be working on uh, bringing forward a, an action plan hopefully early next year to to uh, improve services right we've got councillor creamer with a question just just a very quick one on the domestic violence <clears throat> In sort of dealing with the case, is there any correlation between the mental health and, or any increase at the moment in domestic violence? You know about the iceberg not changing, but is the iceberg changing shape? I mean, is there any is there any evidence of mental health being an issue with these? Two, well, second lockdown in place now, and the first lockdown. Oh, I think I think I think there is. Yes, I think the mental health is. Uh... I suppose it, it, it works both ways. Um, people with mental health problems uh, are quite likely to be perpetrators, um, and victims it affects their their mental health. I'm just thinking we we said that Jim that uh, there's there's been in there have been a, a number of incidents of um, children living at home, older children. Um, actually abusing their their parents parental abuse um and all the the lockdown is just uh, uh, exacerbating all that I mean, there was there was a fairly serious one in your in your patch wasn't there not not so long ago yes and another instance of mental health at the weekend but to, won't go into that it's ongoing <laughs> mm. Okay, are we yep. happy yep. to move on from there? Yeah, please, yep. please do. Yeah. Yep. Right. So move on to selective licensing. You'll be aware that we started the uh, selective licensing scheme in Netherfield in October 2018. And just just to remind you, this is um, land landlords of, of privately rented. Uh, houses have to register with with the council, and uh, we have to satisfy ourselves that they are of a. Um, we, we satisfy ourselves around the, the 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 landlord is a fit and proper person, um, and that the uh, um, the housing is in 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 a reasonable state. And it's uh, it's amazing how how. How we when we go in and inspect the accommodation, 
it's amazing some of the some of the stuff that the uh, environmental health team do discover that people are people are living with um and that their uh, their landlords are quite happy for them for them to live with uh sam has got lots of photographs of uh, of uh, the strange place strange uh, uh arrangements people have people have put in in their how their ha houses which they then feel it's safe to to let to people so we've, we've had the scheme going now for for a couple of years obviously during during lockdown it's been more difficult to uh, uh to keep it to, to to keep up with some of the the inspections um there's there there are limits to how far you can uh, ex extend the scheme without needing secretary of state approval there's a it needs to be in areas that are high levels of uh, of um, high levels of public sector uh, accommodation um but there's but, but we can't extend it more than 20 percent of um 20 percent of of the of the of the borough without such state approval so we do a team's done a lot of work looking at the the statistics uh, on crime on on uh, complaints on on household uh, from housing conditions and uh, have identified these four areas as being the priority for the next areas so we're talking about Carlton Hill and that's basically from the Thornywood estate up towards Carlton Square but not reaching Carlton Square Colic, the area um, between the railway line and the uh, and the Colic Loop. Daybrook, from Sherbrook to to the Poets, and Newstead Village, the area around um, Tilford Road. Those those areas. So it's quite a, a selective area, selective set of areas to. Um, to do, to, and we're out, we're out, we're out. Sorry, sorry. Um, sorry. We, we have got a question from Councillor Barnes, but when you're ready, David. Sorry, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, the, I, I could hear uh, Pete, Peter's thrown, thrown, I could hear him. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're, we're currently out to consult on the scheme. Uh, you'll be, we've no doubt seen the consultation document, fairly extensive rationale for why we're why we're doing doing this um we have uh, consultation meetings with residents and with with landlords and uh, um to come back to to cabinet to hear the hear the, the results okay sandra you've got a question i have my dear thank you very much can i just ask you so much um what regarding this Well, as I said, the, the area we're talking about in Daybrook is from Sherbrooke yeah. to to Poets Corner. Yeah. So that's the area where there's high levels of, as you, well, you know better than I do, high levels of domestic uh, of, of of private uh, private privately yeah. rented accommodation, um, and areas that we think there are uh, like to be uh, problems with the housing conditions. Right. But can I ask you about what information do we get from Gedling Homes or it's or... Get, Gedling Homes is irrelevant. It's nothing to do with the, with the social housing. This is private housing, okay. privately rented. Right. Thank you. OK. Yeah. So can I just clarify? I think you did say public sector at the beginning, David. Did I? Yeah. So Sorry, it's, my, where it's, it's, where it's private it's private it's sector, high levels of private sector private sector housing yeah okay, private sector okay. private private rented housing yeah. yeah okay all right moving on yes yeah so i mean they're, they're the main things i had to 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 talk about i've i've put the next slide to the south nottinghamshire uh, csp which you you have a, a, a statutory requirement to uh to, to review um this, and it's very much co continued as as before um the the three boroughs work together we having one one csp 
means that we can get the other agencies involved where they might not be involved with um, if, there, if there were three CSPs, uh, mm -hmm. we're able to, to share um, information and, um, and and share best best practice and support each other when we have things like domestic homicide reviews. Um, we, we, we support each other um, there and get and, and learn from each other's practice. OK, well, that's great. Has anybody else, has anybody got any more questions for David? Well, I've, I've got the two that you that you wanted, Chair. Yep. Two, two, particular, on, David. Yep. two, two you particularly asked about. Uh, yes, about COVID marshals. Yes. As, as we know, COVID marshals haven't got any enforcement role. That they are uh, the enforcement stays with the police and with uh, the uh, local authority compliance EHOs and people that, that Sam manages. But if you think of the, the, the four E's that the police, uh, the chief chief police officers uh, introduced in uh, when, when lockdown first started, engage, encourage, engage, educate, encourage and enforce. So the COVID marshals deal with the engaging and the educating and the, the encouraging. Uh, they're there to provide a visible presence and um, um, to reinforce reinforce the message. You, yep. you also asked you asked about CCTV. Yes. And how effective that is. Yes. Um, it's one of those things where it's difficult to prove something hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. um, but the research evidence is that uh, CCTV works, particularly in places like uh, like car parks, where it, it d deters um, yeah deters people. Um, and we've got uh, anecdotal evidence of where we, we, ASB has been de deterred. I, I know we, we put the, yep. the camera on Smithy Crescent because that was caused a lot of concern to, to local residents. And we know that that's, uh, that's, moved, that's de deterred that. Um, it's also very useful CCTV in terms of providing evidence. So um, we've, yeah. we've recently improved the quality of the images so they're now more more uh, suitable for to evidence. Um, I'm just might be worth giving you, giving you one example of a recent incident in in uh, Arnold of partnership working, where the uh, Wilcos reported that shop theft. They reported it through their um, their shop watch radio, yeah, which which is basically meant to alert other shopkeepers to yeah. uh, uh, if there's somebody hanging around. Um, CCTV picked picked this up because they've got they've got access to the radio, um, and they 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 clocked the suspect heading down Nottingham Road past uh, Sainsbury's. So uh, the CCTV operator popped out of the control room, went across to the police, and pointed this out to the uh, local, local sergeant who wandered down, who was in Jubilee House, who who wandered down to the to the to the end of Jubilee House. And apprehended the the suspect as he uh, as he was walking past Jubilee yeah. House. <laughs> so that's a pretty good response. Got a question from Councillor Elwood. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I mean you you may you may refer to it uh, uh, in you have a question uh, uh, that David, but. Um, uh, there's reference in the following report about improving the um, CCTV cameras on the Mapley top. Is, is there any plans to um, improve the cameras uh, for the other CCTV cameras um, in, in the borough? Well, Mapley top is just one that's been done recently. Yes, the, it's, it's part of this trying to uh, get them evidentially, uh, evidentially sound. So it, the, the intention will be to improve them, improve them all. Um, OK. It all looks quiet. I can't see anybody with their hand up at the moment. So um, but, oh, hang on. Council Hope, raise his hand. Very, very briefly, that in, in, in the papers that were sent out, there's a very last slide which says links, um, would it be possible to actually email that to us? Because 
I'm looking at those links, and I don't think that the cat in hell's chance of me ever actually being able to type one of those in and get it right. So, you know, if you could just email out that last slide, I don't, the rest is fine, I've got it on paper, but just that last one, links, it would save me an enormous amount of effort. Sure, we can do that, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, so that's been really, um, really interesting, really informative, David, thank you very much. And thank you to um, David, uh, David Jane as, as well. Um, so this, um, we have the statutory duties, David said, to uh, review the community safety and partnerships. Um, that's, that's, that doesn't sound like the right, sorry, that doesn't sound like the right acronym. Community, community safety partnership. That's it. Yeah. So, uh, and so by having David here, we've, um, we've discussed, you know, all the things that community safety partnership do and how how we work alongside them um it might be that a bit later on we're going to be talking about working groups and things it might be that we can we um want to pick up something out of this to uh, carry forward you know as a working group but we can discuss that later on so um helen do you think we're ready to move on to the next item uh yes i think so um joelle and paul are, are both at the meeting now are they? So, David, yeah. you're welcome to stay or you can go as you like. But, uh, Thank but Thank now, you. now over to uh, Joelle and Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, this evening, it's myself and Paul Whitworth, who I think is on the call. Paul, just say hello so everyone can hear you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us tonight. Um, the key, the key thing tonight is to to talk through the recent cabinet report um, on temporary accommodation, um, and to therefore be able to give you the opportunity to ask any questions, um, comment on anything that we provide you, but also to identify if there's any areas that you require any further information going forward. And I think before I get started and, and launch into the report, um, it is a start, starting point. We haven't got um, all the answers yet, but hopefully what you'll hear tonight is, is the progress that we're making and the direction of travel that we want to, to be going in. Um, I, I'm going to go through the Cabinet report in turn because I think it is really useful for you to hear the details and the, the kind of the commentary behind it. Um, and I will go through the four, there were four recommendations in the cabinet report, and I think it's the first one that's really the most important tonight, but I will touch on all four. Um, before I do, though, I just want to highlight that the report and the work that we're doing is joint work that's currently being led um, by myself, but with strategic housing team within my service area, which is um, Alison Bennett and John Shiel. And then, of course, all the work that the housing needs team are doing, um, which is being led by Paul Whitworth. So there is a slight overlap in terms of cabinet members is Councillor Wheeler and it's also Councillor Hollingsworth. So there is a, a, an overlap in terms of the work programme. But actually what we've been able to do is by um, creating a temporary accommodation officer working group, we've been able to identify the key issues and then working together to try and reach a, a resolution and a solution. I'm conscious just in terms of the amount of information that you've just had to digest um, that I will try and talk you through some of the, the tables and some of the numbers in this cabinet report as well. Um, but if you do have any questions, obviously, I think, Chair, you're keeping a lookout as well, aren't you, in terms of any questions? And I'm happy to take them as I go. Um, but okay. just bear with me because sometimes I might be about to just answer it. So uh, we'll see how we get on in terms of answering any questions as we go. So um, in terms of the cabinet report, as I said, it went to uh, cabinet in October this year and all the recommendations were approved. So see, everything I'm saying now um, has had cabinet approval and actually we made quite a lot of progress since we went to cabinet. So I will try and highlight the areas that we've progressed since that report went. So in terms of the cabinet report, as I say, there were four recommendations and I'm going to go through them in turn. Uh, the first recommendation sought approval from Cabinet to note the work being uh, undertaken by officers linked to improving that performance on the average length of stay. 
and this is the key performance indicator which I know overview and scrutiny um, have queried in the past and obviously want more information um, and I am conscious that particular concern was expressed regarding the average length of stay in temporary accommodation uh, which was 23.7 weeks against a target of eight. Now we've subsequently have changed that target to a more realistic figure of 15 weeks, but it is still over and above what we should be going to. So one of the things I just wanted to address straight away, and one of the things that we put in the cabinet report um, is actually why has um, the number of people in temporary accommodation been increasing? And why has the average length of stay also been increasing? And there's there's a lot of different reasons for it and not one answer will, will kind of meet every every particular example. But just to try and summarise kind of the situation that we're in. Um, as a council, um, we're able to access around 200 social tenancies a year um, and that's for general needs, but sheltered accommodation. And of course, it's Gedlin isn't a stockholding authority. We're working with housing providers and partners to try and make sure that we place people appropriately. But actually, the majority of those social tenancies tend to be for the older people, um, whereas actually the majority of our homeless applicants at the minute tend to be singles or couples with family. Now, again, I'm generalising, but it's just to try and give you a flavour. So actually, what we find is the properties that are available to us aren't the right type of properties for the people that are presenting as homeless. Um, and again, just in terms of some numbers, the number of available general needs accommodation fell. Um, so in 2018, we had 172. And actually last year, that fell by another 40. So we only had 131 of general needs accommodation. A second factor is reduced access to the private sector. So previously, the council was able to access affordable accommodation in the private rector, uh, private rector rented sector. Well, that was a tongue twister. Um, but as the <laughs> I'll put my teeth back in, I'll say that again. So previously, the council was able to access affordable accommodation in the private re rented sector. Um, but as competition for the private properties increased, it just made it incredibly difficult. So landlords are charging higher rents and therefore it meant that we just couldn't um, provide them as affordable housing in terms of people on benefits. So that was another factor. A third factor is that actually there are more cases now where people are presenting with multiple and complex needs. And as we can't offer or there's very limited offer of support packages in place due to diminishing resources, but also the, the fact that housing providers now are struggling to provide the type of support that we need. Landlords and housing providers are therefore starting to be more reluctant to take these people with multiple and complex needs on. A fourth factor is that um, with debt and antisocial behaviour, of course, applicants and um, landlords and um, housing providers are again more reluctant to offer these tenancies and therefore that means that we, we have to provide accommodation, temporary accommodation for applicants that present as homeless. And the final factor which I just want to touch on um, is, is the recent changes so in terms of the Homeless Reduction Act but also the welfare reforms means that actually there's just more people needing our help than ever before. Um, and that's just, that's the world that we're currently living in. But of course, what we're trying to do here is to work with them at an earlier stage so they don't come to a point where they're, they're homeless. So again, I know I've rattled through that, but I just wanted to try and give you a bit of background in terms of why we're finding ourselves with more and more people presenting as homeless and why we're relying on temporary accommodation more than ever. And of course, there's a lot of data in the cabinet report in terms of the numbers and also the amount of money and the cost. Um, but what I really want to touch on now is that actually we, we know that that's happening. And so the temporary accommodation officer working group has identified two key streams of work to try and address that. And one of the first one is trying to reduce the time spent in temporary accommodation. Or, or to remove the need completely. That's where we want to be. We want to prevent using temporary accommodation. And if we do use accommodation, that we reduce the amount of time spent. And then the second key thing 
is if we did have to use temporary accommodation, that we make sure we improve the quality and reduce the cost of temporary accommodation. So there's two key things there, preventing it wherever possible, um, and then if we have to use it, make sure that we improve it. Um, so what I want to do now is, if that's okay, Chair, just to talk a little bit more in terms of those two areas of work. So again, I think that will really help overview and scrutiny members understand the work that officers are currently doing. Um, yeah, so, I, in I just ask Joel, is, Joel, is this yeah. is this happened since get, since the cabinet report? Is that what you're saying? This is like no, no, no. really current now. Yeah, we're absolutely working on it. So the working group is meeting fortnightly at the minute. Um, we've ramped it up since the cabinet approval to be able to really progress at pace to make some more of these things happen. But again, what I'm hoping to talk through now is some of the things that I've included in the cabinet report, but of course, okay. update it where we've been. So in terms okay. of that first um, key stream of work, the, the kind of prevention or reducing time in temporary accommodation, um, there's various things that officers have been doing. Um, in an ideal world, we would never need temporary accommodation because everyone would get a secure tenancy in an affordable or social house. Um, and of course, what we're trying to do is working with our colleagues in planning is to essentially be able to build more social and more affordable housing through the yeah. planning process and I know that's not easy and so for those of you that assist on planning committee I appreciate that there's viability issues and that there are other problems but actually that would be an ideal solution we'd just have access to more social and affordable housing so we do look at working with our planning colleagues to try wherever possible to secure as much as we can through the planning process but also working in partnership with our housing providers that are active in the area. We work with them, we identify sites and we try to support them to secure funding and to buy sites on the open market. And again, we've had a couple of successes recently, so that's an area of work that we're very keen on doing. The third aspect to this is actually, as a council, we owned land, own our own land and actually there's scope to build our own social and affordable houses. So one of the uh, projects that uh, my team are currently working on is the land that we own at Station and Burton Road. Now, these are only small sites, but actually they could deliver up to 17 affordable or temporary accommodation units. And again, they'd be in our control. So that's something that we are also looking at doing. The, the, the next aspect to, to the prevention or the kind of reducing the time in temporary accommodation is, is actually how we link in um, homeless applicants to um, tenancies. And so the way that we can do that and the control that we have is through the housing allocation policy. So um, you're, we've, we've talked about the housing allocation policy previously at Overview and Scrutiny. And actually there's a real opportunity to prioritise those people that are present as homeless and to give them um, priority priority um, need in terms of being able to allocate them places. In terms of where we are with that, we've done two rounds of public consultation and we're proposing to take the final set of changes back to Cabinet in the next couple of months to get that signed off and to be able to implement that. And as I say, that will then give people that present as homeless the, the opportunity for to be prioritised on the waiting list. Okay. Um, I'm Joel, conscious Joel. I've got a question from Council Hope. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the report that I read earlier and, and I wanted to ask um, if if Gedling Borough build properties, do they then get passed over to a housing association or are we actually saying here that we're reintroducing what I wholly support, which is um, Gedling Borough having its own housing stock and um, we're, we're back to the days when we had council houses when in fact we didn't have this problem particularly. Yeah and it's a very good very good question Um, both are options actually so as landowner we have complete kind of control in terms of what we do, whether we want to work in partnership with a housing provider or whether we want to actually build and own those properties going forward. Um, I, 
<coughs> the work is being done at the minute to do a business case on the basis of us actually building and owning the properties as our own. So going back to the old, good old, like you say, the days of having council houses, it won't be quite the same, but that is the work that we're currently doing. Um, but that will be subject to a further cabinet approval. So although that is the 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 route that we're currently going down obviously I can't predetermine the cabinet or or sign that off but that's absolutely what we're looking at doing um as part of this process is to yes to build and to control our own housing going forward can I, can I say uh, Rachel Ellis councillor Rachel Ellis thank you um it's obviously right and proper that families with children should be given uh, appropriate priority, but um, are we also looking at the, the single homeless um, in terms of uh, studio or one bedroom flats, that kind of thing? Absolutely. And another part of the what I'll be explaining in a bit is actually we are doing a full options appraisal. Of Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we could hear you, Rachel. I could hear you, Rachel. Yeah, I heard you. Yes, Councillor Ellis, I heard. Um, just saying that in the future, um, and I will talk about this in a little bit more detail soon, um, but we are undertaking a full temporary accommodations options appraisal, which is currently reviewing all all people that are all, all households placements that are in temporary accommodation and trying to do what we can to make sure that we provide suitable accommodation going forward. So absolutely, um, we, we look at all, all types. Um, and I think, was there... Yeah, I've got Sam Smith, Councillor Sam Smith. Thank you. Uh, Joelle, the, as part of the government's investing 433 million, I think it is, into delivering 6,000 new homes to tackle this particular issue. And I think Gedling got £311,000 roughly uh, to help with move on style homes for vulnerable people who are going to become homeless. Is Will that fund from this count, the council's got? be invested into these particular projects you're talking about rather than spending it on a temporary accommodation you might it might be too early to know that no um, and bear with me I, I will touch on funding and what we're doing in a little bit but absolutely we want to try and prioritize any external funding on permanent uh, solutions to temporary accommodation rather than um, spending it on B&B &B. but I, I, and I, I will answer the question in a bit more detail as we go through the report if that's okay Councillor Smith but if I don't answer it at that point will you give me a nudge and I'll, I'll answer it then because I think that the next bit that I just wanted to cover which is really important with all of this is actually in an ideal world we would just prevent people from being homeless or presenting as homeless and I don't want to make it sound simple because it isn't. But actually, if we could tackle the problem before they arrive on our doorstep or at the council building asking for help, then actually that's a much better way of doing it. So what the working group have done, and this is one of the first pieces of work that we did, is actually do a range of initiatives to try to get to a point, as I say, to prevent homelessness. And I, I do want to touch on it in a little detail because actually I think it's really important to show what work we've already done. So this is detailed in paragraph 2.3.4 in the Cabinet report. Um, and these are the various initiatives that we've started to work on. So if I, I'll just go through them in a little bit of detail. Um, the first one is the core before you serve. Um, and this is actually working in partnership um, it's a specialist support service for private landlords um, who are considering evicting a tenant or seeking possession or just generally needing advice on tenancy support. And the idea with this is actually if we can provide the support to the landlord, they may never get to the point where they evict a tenant. And again, that's an ideal situation for us going forward. Um, so there is a bit of detail there in terms of um, if you want more information about how that works. But actually, that was a, a project that was funded by external funding, again, the rough sleeping initiative. And so instead of actually using the funding to put people in B&B, &B, what we're trying to do is, is target kind of the root, the cause of the problem, rather than necessarily trying to find a solution at the end. Um, the second aspect is actually that what we found is that a lot of people that are facing eviction or have problems don't necessarily know that the council can be there to help support them. 
Um, so we did quite a bit of advertising and letting people know that we're there. So from a variety of things. So we had um, a bus campaign. So this was definitely pre pre COVID. Uh, we had a, a bus campaign. So on all the buses that were around the borough, um, we had an advert to say, you know, if you're having any problems facing eviction, please ring the team. Um, we're happy to help. Um, we also um, have run a Google ad. So again, this is something um, with all the new technology. Essentially, if you're facing <coughs> eviction or you're looking at evicting a tenant, get into Google search, evict a tenant, or how do I how do I evict my tenant? Um, and actually, one of the things uh, one of the things that will pop, pop up is if you're in if you're in the borough. It'll be a straight away contact the council's housing needs team, happy to help. Um, or if it's a tenant, have you have you are you aware of call before you serve? Please contact this number and we can try and help you. And again, it, it nips the problem straight away. Before there's any issues, the idea is trying to give them the help and support that we need. Another aspect that we were really keen on doing is actually some of the data that we'd found is that we were seeing there were parental evictions. So actually um, parents were essentially um, kicking their kids out of the, ha the family home. And so the, ki the, the children would be coming or the, the young adults would be coming into the council for support. So one of the things that we did and again working with a, a partner, Broxo Youth Homeless, um, they actually started to do a series of sessions in schools. Now, unfortunately, that hasn't run the full course because of COVID. But again, we're looking at other routes. But again, it's just trying to say to, to kind of young people, there are, are options. If you're facing these kind of problems, please come and talk to us. We can try and help. Um, so that was one aspect, another aspect. Uh, another option, another initiative that we've run um, is to use the Citizens Advice Bureau. Now, they already do a lot of really good work for us at Gedlin and, and support a lot of our vulnerable uh, residents. But one of, the, one of the initiatives that we've run as a pilot is actually what we would wanted to test is if people are facing eviction and they're, they're facing the fear of, of not having a, a house or home, um, that potentially they would have um, medical problems or they would have stress related issues and would be going to their doctors for help. So what we actually did is we ran a pilot where CAB were present in, a, in one of our GP surgery um, just to see if we could kind of capture those people and to be able to offer advice. Now, again, what we found is actually that that has has had some success. Again, it was difficult because of the, what happened with GP surgeries and a lot of them shut down. But it is something that we are quite keen to try and do a little bit more. And then the final Hello. initiative. Oops, I've got a question from Councillor Barnes. Hello. Thank you very much. Can I just ask you, Joa, have we actually housed all those that have come to the council for help? Paul, that's definitely your question, answer. Um, so for what period are you talking? I mean, yes, obviously, um, once they're taking into uh, temporary accommodation, we, we will continue to work with them until they're housed. Um, sometimes they find the accommodation themselves, um, which is very helpful, and we encourage them to do that, um, especially in the private sector. Um, like Joel alluded to earlier, you know, the numbers are... Uh, diminishing on a, on a yearly basis so we are trying to encourage people to to source their own accommodation and, and we can help them with things like um, bonds and rent in advance which is always an ongoing issue for them um, but obviously sometimes we place people in temporary accommodation and they just they just disappear on us so I can't safely say that we you know we have a hundred percent success rate but um, whilst they're under our under our care we will work with them tirelessly to try and resolve their, their housing situation. Thank you very much. And then just finally, the final initiative that I wanted to, to reference um, here, and actually it's, it's linked to our own staff. So through the external funding we've secured and the government grants that we get given, um, we've actually put some of that funding into two housing prevention offices. Um, and again, the idea of these offices is their specific role is to work with people to prevent them from being homeless by offering advice and guidance um, and also working with either landlords or family members as well. So they're two, they're two officers that we've now got in post 
um, to be able to try and help address that. So I know that was quite detailed, but I thought it was really important for, for uh, overview and scrutiny members to understand the, the work that we're doing in terms of prevention and also trying to reduce whatever time we can when people are in temporary accommodation. Now, I think that the key thing to say here is that as much as we're working on that, we will all that there will always be a need for temporary accommodation. You know, we're never going to be able to get away from the fact that somebody might might turn up at the council at four o'clock on a Friday for whatever reason um, and needs temporary accommodation. And we need we, we have a right, we have a duty to provide them with housing. So although we don't want to use temporary accommodation or if we do, we want it to be good quality. I don't want you to go away and think that temporary accommodation will be completely eradicated because actually there, there is always still going to be a need um, for it. And I know Paul's nodding because it's something that as much <laughs> as we don't want to use it, it's there for a, it is there for a good reason. Um, but as I say, the second aspect to the working group and actually one of the things that we're really keen on, as I say, is that if we are having to use temporary accommodation, that it is good quality and that the provision of it is suitable. We've got a question from Councillor Boyle. Thanks very much, uh, Liz. Um, uh, Joelle, I think, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the introduction you, uh, to, to this piece you've done so far. It was very detailed and, and very informative, so thank you for that. So so that's the first bit. Uh, two, two things. One on temporary accommodation. Uh, the question I had, is there a presumption that that temporary accommodation would be within, within Gedley, or is it much wider than that? I think we had discussed that. On a previous uh, on on a previous scrutiny meeting, and what the breakdown of that is, and the costs therefore of that, um, and the other one uh, earlier when you said you were working uh, you you're working on your proposals and the current um, um, building things for Burton Road and so on, uh, uh, the presumption was that you were going to possibly manage those things as, uh, as Gedling and have our own housing stock, which is which I agree with Councillor Hope is is definitely the way I want to go. Is that sort of general? Are you uh, suggesting that would be generally the presumption, or whether there's uh, there is a, a different a different emphasis for other for other proposals and how would you how you would view that? OK, so if I answer the second question first and then Paul can be thinking about the answer to question one, um, you can see what I did there. Um, so in terms of Station and Burton Road, because of the um, the current issues that we have in terms of temporary accommodation, it is officers view that to control those properties actually gives us a lot more flexibility going forward. So I sound if I sound hesitant, it's because I haven't we haven't had that cabinet approval to go down that route. But absolutely at the minute we feel that that's the most appropriate use of that land um, and to be able to control the houses going forward, whether that's for affordable housing, um, move on accommodation or, or temporary accommodation. We feel at the, at the current stage that that's really important to, to progress. So I'm sorry if I sounded hesitant, it is only because we haven't had that cabinet approval. Um, but no, there's no doubt that that actually is the opportunity. There is a real opportunity there for, for us to do something. Um, and in answer to question, the first question, Councillor Boyle, Paul. Um, well, currently it, um, we're using a lot of bed and breakfast, as you're probably aware of, and, and the majority of those bed and breakfast are, are currently located outside of the borough and would be predominantly in the Nottingham City area. Um, now, there will be instances where things with like domestic violence and things like that, where we would have to place outside the borough anyway. So that's always going to be a consideration. Um, but I, I feel that the work that we're doing at the moment, and it depends on the options appraisal as to which options that we take, I, I would say that we're predominantly looking to, to have our own uh, accommodation within our own borough. Um, we have currently got some, um, we've got about 13 units currently. Um, and I can't see any reason why we wouldn't want to uh, maximise that with, with the, the Burton and Station Road projects and, and other options that we've got. Um, but again, it just depends once we look into that where the availability is. But as I say, I'd, I'd imagine that would be in the borough. Okay, okay. I, can, I can see Councillor Hope's got a question as well now. Yeah, it, it, it links up very much with what's just been said. But um, I'm looking at your table one on page 37. Um, and, it, and it appears that the, the demand for temporary accommodation, um, yeah, if we had 35 more places, 
um, we would more or less cover it most of the time. Um, and it also seems to me that, that we are continually accepting that um, developers can't build affordable housing, so give the borough money. Surely, you know, this is a, you know, this is a good compromise. If we, if we could generate um, 35 um, of mixed type, temporary accommodation owned by the borough council, controlled by the borough council, then to, to, to a large extent, um, table one, uh, use of temporary accommodation by that disappears because it's our accommodation and we've got somewhere to put people whenever they turn up. We're not scratching around. Um, and you know, it, it seems absolutely self-evident to me that that's the road we should be going down. And Councillor Hope, you've just stolen my next uh, oh, sorry, next sorry, piece sorry, of sorry. Well, yeah. <laughs> But I'm glad that I'm pushing on an open door here because the next bit I just wanted to talk through is actually if we've accepted that we need temporary accommodation, and again, we want to try and reduce that going forward with those initiatives that I've mentioned, that actually um, that tables one and two in the report do show that there is is a clear need for, for temporary accommodation. And I promise I have got it written down. That's what I was going to say next in terms of um, in terms of what officers are working on, because actually the council does already have access to 13 properties. Some of them we own and some of them are on leases, but actually 13 just isn't enough. And the part of the cabinet report that went was saying that actually at the minute to cover that gap, officers are having to use b and B on other nightly accommodation as temporary accommodation and actually it, it isn't working and it's not ideal in terms of the, the facilities and it's also a very expensive way of, of dealing with it. So what officers were seeking in terms of the cabinet report is to say actually we've we've got five different things that we're currently working on that we want to do more on and as I say these are these are detailed in paragraph 2.4.6 in the report but essentially, if I just quickly try and summarise where we are, the easy thing and the kind of the most straightforward thing is actually just have access to more properties. Like you say, Council Hope, just buy or lease more properties. And so the work I've mentioned that we're doing a, an options appraisal on all of our temporary accommodation and what we need going forward. So, again, that work's being undertaken and again is subject to a cabinet approval in terms of going forward and, and setting up a capital budget to buy or acquire to lease properties but absolutely let's accept that we need more temporary accommodation and take a kind of take a stance and to do something so that's one thing to secure additional properties um, and part of that is actually securing external funding and um, so officers are currently working on um, applying for external uh, funding and again I'll touch on that in a little bit more detail um, but actually um, there, there are other ways so one of the things that we've we're we're currently working on is that actually to improve the facilities in temporary accommodation is to have a framework a, a procurement framework that we can actually set our standards and to make sure that if we do have to use B&B &B accommodation in the future that is of a good quality um, and meets our current standards and to make sure that that's clearly identified. But the, the other aspect I just want to touch on is actually that sometimes we need a different type of accommodation. So we work very closely with framework and um, we also have a severe weather emergency protocol and um, so rough sleepers are given the opportunity to have a bed for the night through the winter months. So it, there's not one answer to fit all but essentially, Council, I hope you summarised it quite nicely, let's just get access to more properties um, and that's absolutely what officers are currently working on doing and as I say that's one of the things that we wanted to make sure in terms of direction of travel that cabinet were supportive of that approach and obviously the, the report was approved and the comments from cabinet at the time was absolutely this is the way to go you know go away and work on it and come back to us with your final kind of projects and, and for a further approval. Um, Joelle, I've got a question from Councillor Rachel Wellis. Thank you. Um, personally, I'm very much in favour of the council um, uh, owning and being able to control certainly temporary accommodation. 
Um, can you confirm that we would not be at any risk um, from the right to buy legislation um, if we did go ahead and, and build or purchase uh, temporary accommodation? Yeah, and um, Councillor Ellis, this is a very good point. And obviously, if we're spending public money or Section 106 monies, um, we'd, we'd have to make sure that we fully understand any risks um, that are associated with that. And actually, part of the options appraisal we're doing is, is fully looking into the legalities and also the financial appraisal. But essentially, and to summarise, I guess to answer your question, as temporary accommodation, right to buy wouldn't apply. Um, right to buy would apply to other affordable housing if we were to build it but actually there are ways of us being able to make sure that we don't lose out financially from that and um, so actually there is an opportunity through right to buy to get a, a, a receipt for the property that we could potentially then reuse but that's absolutely what we're looking at doing in terms of the business case and why we need to go to cabinet for approval because there are pros and cons to this there are risks um, and obviously it is a, we are spending public money. So again, all of that is being considered, but but yeah, including right to buy. So I hope I've answered that. But yeah, right to buy doesn't apply to temporary accommodation. It would to affordable housing. Um, but again, there are ways that we can try to reduce the financial risk um, going forward. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I'm, I'm so long as we can uh, invest back in the housing stock, then Perhaps a little bit of churn isn't a bad thing, but uh, we need to keep control over a, a appropriate housing. Thank you. So I think, Chair, just in terms of this section, and I just want to summarise it really, because actually the only way to reduce the need for temporary accommodation is to be able to access more permanent affordable accommodation. And it, it, I know it sounds, but actually if we could house people in permanent tenancies, then actually that's our problem solved. Um, we do have a statutory duty to accommodate um, individuals and their households that, that are homeless. And as we've shown and as we've talked about a little bit, actually, currently, we're providing a lot of temporary accommodation in comparison to what we actually have access to. So we are relying on B&Bs and nightly accommodation. What officers are seeking and what we're currently working on is to try to reduce that reliance on B&B and nightly accommodation, which are expensive and don't necessarily meet all the standards that we would like. Um, and officers are currently working on those options to how we would do that. Um, and obviously that would be subject to various other cabinet approvals, which will be over the next few months. So I fully imagine that this will be something that we can come back to you and update you in terms of where we're where we're working towards and the progress that have been made um, i'm conscious that in the cabinet report there were three other recommendations and i don't want to not reference them but actually i think the main bulk of the questions overview and scrutiny had were specifically about the indicator and what we're doing um, but actually, just to emphasise, I guess, the approvals that we've already got and the, the work that the officer working group is doing is that um, officers identified as part of the second recommendation that actually um, we really emphasise the point to Cabinet that actually there is a real need for us to intervene now and to make some significant changes to the temporary accommodation that we use. And I just want to highlight this because it is something that we will touch on going forward, but for two key reasons, health and wellbeing implications. So just not to labour the point, but actually if you're placed in a B&B &B accommodation, you know, trying to cook a healthy meal is just not possible. And if you're already living on benefits, um, and you go into the food bank, the difficulty is then you can't necessarily cook yourself a healthy meal. And um, so again, in terms of health and well-being implications, we're very keen to make sure that if we use temporary accommodation, we increase the standards. And then the second aspect um, is just the, it's the cost. It's the cost of using B&B &B and nightly accommodation. Um, it's often much more expensive than other options. And of course, if we're spending public money, we want to try and spend it in the right way, either with prevention or putting people into permanent tenancies rather than a stopgap measure of B&B. &B. So again, as I've mentioned, officers are working on that options appraisal, how we can try and increase our access to temporary accommodation. 
and to make sure that we take back further options um, to Cabinet in the next couple of months on that. So that was the second recommendation. And as a Cabinet, we're very keen for us to progress that work. The, the third recommendation is actually officers had already started to work on other external funding opportunities. And there was funding um, through the Next Steps Accommodation Programme um, which we'd bid for and we, we'd we submitted a two-phase bid and the details are all in section 2.5 of the report. But essentially, um, since then, we've had confirmation that although um, the, the funding was massively oversubscribed, um, priority was given to those, those bids that worked collaboratively and also could show partnership working that could deliver quickly. So actually through the good work that Paul's team do with Framework, uh, we managed to be able to secure funding. So Framework can now have um, can now provide eight further units for us in terms of temporary accommodation across three boroughs, which again really adds to the flexibility of, of what Framework provide for us. Um, and there is also some further funding that's been awarded for us to be able to block books and temporary accommodation for the winter months. Now, again, that, that will be B&B &B or nightly accommodation. But again, the idea with that is if we block book it, um, then we've absolutely got access to it over the winter. And especially with COVID and, and various other aspects, to be able to secure that funding and have that in place was a real a real bonus for us we're really really pleased with that and as I say it was massively oversubscribed so the team did really well to get the funding that they did and then just to, as a fourth point and I'm just to kind of go into a little bit of the detail actually a lot of what we've talked about today was about the council intervening and doing more and one of the one of the things that we needed to get approval from was to actually to apply to Homes England for investment partner status status what this means is actually now we can apply for Homes England funding ourselves and to be able to hopefully deliver more affordable homes or temporary accommodation in the borough, as would any other housing provider. Um, so the team are working currently on submitting that, that um, application to Homes England. And what we'd like to think going forward is that we'll be able to secure further external funding to be able to deliver some of those other priorities and projects that we've, we've briefly touched on tonight. So. I'm conscious, Chair, Chair, that I've rattled through some of those last few recommendations, but I think I just wanted to, to highlight kind of the, the, the rest of the work that, that we are doing and how it might all fit together. Um, uh, we've got Councillor Barnes got a question. No, it's not a question. I just oh. want to say that it's been a very hard and difficult time. So I'd just like to say we thank you for all your hard work because I think you've done a brilliant job. Thank you, my darling. Thank you to Paul. Thank you to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. I've got Councillor Paling as well. Thank you. Uh, mine was the same. I, I, I wanted to say it sounds really exciting times. It's just such a shame that such development can't be done overnight and it's going to take a little bit of time, but good luck. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Councillor. Island. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say as well, it's been uh, it's been really, um, really interesting to hear about it all. And I was, ex you know, it was exciting reading the report about all what's uh, what's coming up, especially some of these houses are going to be in my ward. So that was exciting. <laughs> well, well, of course, subject to any cabinet approval, I have to keep yeah. saying that. But yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I really appreciate the the kind of the questions, the feedback from tonight. I think it gives Paul and I kind of that comfort that we're heading in the right direction. Um, I think the other thing I will just mention is that we're very keen to current. We're going to review everybody in temporary accommodation. Uh, we're doing a caseload review just to really start to fully understand all the specifics of each of those cases. Um, and again, that's going to help us inform similar to Councillor Ellis's question earlier, actually, in terms of making sure that we've got the right accommodation for the right people going forward um, and also to try and work out, you know, touched on complex and complex needs and, and specific issues that some of our um, some of our placements have. So again, we, we are doing quite a lot of work and that, that's happened since cabinet approval. Um, so absolutely now we've, we've got the approvals we need to, to take this next big step. And uh, Chair, if you'd like us to come back and to outline 
kind of once we've got those cabinet approvals, we'd be more than happy to do that to kind of give you an update of where we've got to and, and yeah. what's next. I think it's a. I'm, I'm it seeing some nodding heads on my screen from what I can see. Um, so okay. that sounds, uh, yeah, that, that sounds really good. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll set that up. So I know Rachel put something in the chat as well before. I'll just flick on to this. Um, oh, yeah, about um, the approach of um, heading off homelessness with the residents is being really effective. Rachel mentioned that point earlier on in the chat so, yeah and i think it is it's always prevention's better than cure isn't it but uh, we've also got to realize that we we do need to have both really as you say there will always be need for temporary accommodation um at some point you know for some people okay so everybody happy moving on helen are you happy we're moving on now Is helen there Just, I don't know. I don't know if Helen's there anyway. Yes, yeah, I'm just oh, said yes. <laughs> oh, sorry, you weren't. You weren't on the. I think you were still on mute, Helen. All right. Yes, that's fine. That. So, uh, just to say thank you to Joelle and Paul for um, attending this evening. So you're welcome yeah. to stay, but you can. You're welcome to leave as well if you want to. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. I think we'll go if that's okay. okay thank then. you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, OK, so now we're going to move on to the um, scrutiny work programme. Um, so um, just a couple of minutes, the planning policy um, consultation has gone off to the um, planning policy officer. And uh, so they've taken that forward. Um, we'll give you a quick update on the flooding. Hang on a minute. I made some notes about the um the flooding working group uh, we had another we had another meeting a couple of weeks ago it was really i found it a really really interesting meeting anyway um we had some um officer from the council talk to us uh, about what get what Gedlingborough council does in the event of flooding and some things they've done to help prevent flooding like or these big these big tanks they've put in and things which i had no no idea about it's really uh it's so they talked about that. So the next steps is um, Helen's setting up a meeting with the county council um, about and about what they do in terms of the flooding, in terms of the gully clearing, and obviously they're the they're the lead authority on flooding as well. So also uh, Michael Adams is going to attend that meeting as well um, as chair of that working group. So um, I think that was all about the flooding. Was it Helen? Do you want to add anything else about uh, the flooding? Yes, yes, I'm going to. I'm sitting in a meeting with the um, county council and um, Michael Adams, and uh, but then we will come back to the working group. Um, we just want to um, clarify with the highways um, department of the county council what exactly they are going to um, discuss with the group. So we, um, I shall be arranging a meeting as soon as possible, as soon as I can get one sorted. Right, I've got um, councillor Ellis next. Thank you. Yeah, just just a query really. Um, is this working group open to uh, other members to attend, or is it a closed group? No, no. You'd be welcome to attend. You you will have missed the first meeting, um, but um, we've got the slides and I've got some notes. It is a very complex and technical area, um, so um, you probably need to read them or have a look at them before you um, attend the first meeting. But if you want me to include you in, in any future meetings, that, that's no problem. Thank you. OK. So, uh, yeah, OK. Sam Smith. This isn't a technical or complicated question. Page 45, Councillor Martin Smith's name twice. Um, I think one of them should be me, but thank you. Oh no. Hang on a minute. Just a minute. No. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I've just missed an S. Yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah. I know what I meant. <laughs> I know what I meant. <laughs> yeah. So that's where we're up to with the flooding. Um so when they've had the meeting with the county council, I guess we'll have another meet meeting of the working group at that point. Um 
so now we've got we've kind of got a space for another working group now so we wanted to think of any if anybody's got any burning issue that they want to that they want to bring forward at this point we did discuss at an early committee about doing um, a review into affordable housing, but I think as we are, um, we've just had the talk from Joelle and she's going to come back. I don't think there's much point in us um, pursuing that at the moment. So really, we need to think of something else that members would like to focus on. Uh, so we've got Councillor Hope. It's on moot. Still on mute. Uh, he, he's not. Oh, there he is. No, no, he's not on my screen. No, oh, he's just... you're right. You're right. I was. There he is. <laughs> so, so, what I was saying was, we've been talking about temporary accommodation and and the problems of homelessness as such, but we haven't really been talking about affordable housing, mm. and I think it's an issue we do have to address because. Um, when we looked at the, 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 the report from the offices, um, what, what was it? Um, I can't remember the figures now, but, but the target was 150 affordable houses and uh, the, 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 the actual um, result was something like three. It was a huge difference, an absolutely ridiculous difference between the target for affordable housing and, and what we actually built. And it, you know, in my opinion, you know, probably housing, temporary temporary accommodation certainly, but housing is 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 one of the major issues that we do have to deal with. You know, I I, I know in and I'm I'm very parochial, but I know I know in Calverton, you know, we 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 have an issue with um, people who just now cannot afford any of the 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 afford the, the housing that's being built in Calverton, whether it be affordable housing or non-affordable housing. I think we need to look at this issue because um it's getting worse by the day. I mean I don't I'm I'm not fully you know all that up with all this but I don't know is there a lot we can do to control that? Because we can make recommendations to to cabinet to the council, um, you know, which which actually does say um, one. I understand um, when 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 uh, building affordable housing is not viable, um, and, and a careful study is made. I don't understand um, the, the situation where a developer simply says, look, you know, I need to move forward. I can't sell these houses, so I'll give you some money and I'll not make them affordable. I don't, I don't understand that. And I also think we need to look at the implications of the new white paper, which is saying there will be no affordable housing on, on developments which are um, under 50 houses up until now it's been under 10. Uh, it's, that's a big difference and, and really if, if, if we are committed to getting as much affordable housing in with the authority as we can um, maybe we should look at it and uh, make recommendations uh, okay. I, I'm in your hands I mean you know but all, all I don't want to do is is conflate temporary accommodation which we've talked about yeah. tonight which is important yeah. and affordable housing which i also think is important and actually finding some way of probably you see th th this is where it came out to us. if there is some way of this council um increasing its own housing stock maybe maybe that's the way out be be yeah. because it, because essentially um, an awful lot of people um, would, would would be happy to live in a council house. Okay, I'll see what anyway, you're I, I, to say. 
I've got a few people waiting now. I've got Rachel, Jim and Martin. Rachel. OK, should I? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, what occurs to me, having listened to the presentation on domestic abuse, uh, is whether we might be interested in a working party looking at um, the services that Gedling offers to victims of domestic abuse, whether we can up our game in this area uh, and in particular uh, support for the range of potential victims, which includes men, which includes members of the LGBT and, and uh, trans communities, um, and also, which also has a sideways look at housing, um, whether um, one of the things we need to be considering is, is refuge accommodation within the borough, bearing in mind, of course, that people quite often need to move to be safe so that we would be offering refuge accommodation to people outside the borough, but there's certain mutuality here in, in as much as everyone's uh, attempting to improve the services Gedling residents who need to flee uh, violence uh, may be able to move to wherever it is, whether it's uh, Warwickshire or, or whatever. So, so that was my thought in terms of um, a working group and what we might look at. Okay, Jim. Yeah, so, um, I'm. Yeah, I'll, I'll go along with uh, what Rachel was saying, but I actually originally put my hand up to uh, say that. Uh, on Mike Hope's issues, which I agree with, by the way, mm -hmm. it's a, perhaps one of the issues we might look at, and I don't know if it's affects Gedling, is is there an issue of land banking at all in Gedling? Because apart from anything else, when you actually say affordable housing, when it's affordable housing, it's 80% of the current value in the area, that's not realistic to an awful lot of people anyway. So I'm just wondering if we had an issue of land banking or not. But as far as domestic violence, I think that's probably more urgent, to be quite honest, because that's a multi-agency thing. The county council is involved, the police are involved, health service is involved. So that would be a very useful thing to have a look at. But I'm easy both ways. OK, I've got Martin Smith. Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, just a suggestion uh, from myself and, and from Sam. Um, very much enjoyed David David's uh, presentation. Uh, he talked about the increase in antisocial behaviour, uh, and I think, I'm not sure whether he, he got any facts on this, or but he actually he, he interpreted that as being down to COVID breaches and neighbours reporting on each other. I'm not quite so sure it's as simple as that. Certainly within my ward. Um, Antisocial behaviour is is not neighbor, neighbours reporting on each other. It's actual um, wanton damage, uh, and by pri primarily young people. Uh, and what I'd like to suggest is that that this this and, and again it was a seventy four percent increase. He's he, he talked about in in the in the year to date. Uh, number 826 cases. I'd like to suggest that we, we have perhaps have a, have a look at uh, antisocial behaviour and review how this council actually um, can can actually alleviate that and what input that the council can have in, into the alleviation of antisocial behaviour. Mm. I, I wonder if that's something we could have like uh, more something we could have a report on and have some more details about that presented to us. Would that be uh, an idea? That would be one way to um, look at that, and then we could, um, if we don't pick it up as a review this time, if we if we get a report, I'll get um, the more detailed report from um, David and and um, bring it back to the committee, and we could perhaps look at that at a later date, if that would be if that suits everybody, or if we pick it up as well, you need to decide which review. You want yeah. to prioritise really. Yeah, I've just, I've just got Michael Boyle to come in as well still, so Michael. Thank you Chair, thanks Liv. Um, picking up from where, where we were talking about Councillor Hope, uh, Creamer and Ellis, so, you know, and different, uh, different options that we might have. Actually, uh, the issue of affordable housing and housing options in terms of temporary accommodation and all those sort of things 
is very linked uh, to the issue of domestic violence, of course, and, and the options that people might have in order to get out of a situation they they feel forced to be in. So actually, sort of um, move on and options uh, for uh, domestic violence were, perhaps would cover both those areas, and I would be uh, see what we we can do uh, do on on that because I, you know, and what we might be able to as a councillor contribute to 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 the kind of supports, temporary accommodation, other support, and other options that people might have. Mm -hmm. um, so I would suggest that that could be an angle that we could look at it. I'm not sure if it's an angle that to, we've managed to focus on quite as much as we as we 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 had before. So. So, so I, uh, that would be my suggestion. Can I add something at this point as well? Because I don't, uh, because like I said, I don't know how much influence we can have over the affordable housing thing. Could we have, could we have some more information about how much influence we can have over that sort of thing? Who would be able? Would there be somebody able to give that sort of information, Helen? Um, I can find out who it is. Um, I, I think Joel will probably have an input into it. Question. No, no. I, um, I can. I'll do. I can. You know, to find out who it would, uh, who would be able to talk to us about that. Um, and um, I could ask them to come along to the get some to come along to the next meeting before we actually decide to do it as a review. I'm just trying to see okay. what's on the program for next time. I, I kind of Ooh, just we've got quite a lot on next time I've anyway, got, haven't we? I've got Sam Smith and Marge Failing wanting yeah. to talk now as well. So Sam, you're next. Thanks. Thank you, Jane. So just to echo what more Councillor Martin Smith said, I think uh, David Ellis's presentation was really detailed and uh, really useful. Antisocial behaviour in Trent Valley is more young adults um, causing chaos on parks, etc. late at night, up to no good. And it'd be quite interesting to see, uh, as a working group, um, what, what more the council can do to support the neighbourhood policing teams in that. Um, I know they've grown by 25 officers in Gedlin, which is great, but you know, a bit more of the outreach stuff that um, the officer mentioned would be helpful to see how we can help reduce that. Yeah, Councillor Payne. I don't really think there's much point in having someone to talk to us about the viability question at both uh, okay. delegation panel meetings and at planning committee. We always question uh, the viability argument. Um, and we always, the planning department themselves, actually get an independent assessment. They don't rely on the um, assessment that the um, applicant has produced. There is an independent assessment which we pay for, uh, which almost, I think almost always, I think it has been invariably in support of their claim on viability. Uh, the, the one good thing is that what we have re introduced is a review so that if their um, sales have not gone through within the set period, uh, we do have the opportunity to, to check if the um, circumstances that led to the viability claim have changed so that if the housing sales uh, situation has improved, we can get, then get some money that we had hoped to get in the first place. It's not a, an ideal situation, but I, I really, I mean, that's, that's a very quick synopsis of what we've learned at planning committee. Um, and it, I think we've got other things that we could spend time on rather than looking at that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marge. I think that's kind of explained what, what maybe I was trying to, <laughs> what I was trying to uh, allude to. So that's really useful. Thank you very much. So um, I think, um, coming out of the I, can't, I couldn't see any more hands at the moment so um coming out of this i think the domestic abuse thing see and what Gedlinborough council does and what we could do more seems to be quite a quite a popular thing to look at a little bit more um as as a working group and then for, perhaps on the antisocial behavior we could get a bit more of a breakdown on what what air the what the problems are in the different areas and um, go from and go from there. Would that be acceptable to everybody? I can see Sam nodding. 
Um, does anybody yeah. want to say anything? I think that's a fair way of addressing those points that people are passionate about on behalf of their residents. So I'd go with that, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay, Helen? Yeah, that's fine. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll start to get some uh, something together about domestic abuse, and we'll we'll have a meeting to discuss the focus and key uh, aspects that we want to look at. Um, can I ask who would like to, if we are doing a review into domestic abuse, who would like to be included? Yeah, I'd like to do it. Oh, hang on, I can see. Oh, um, can you see everyone? Ellen yes. wants to. Uh, um, Michael Boyle, Sandra. Rachel Ellis, Sandra Barnes, Marge, yeah. myself. I can't see anybody else. Yeah, I've got uh, Councillor Ellis, um, yourself, uh, Councillor Boyle, Councillor Barnes, and Councillor Paley. Yes, they're, they're the people I could see. Okay. Is there, is there anybody else that we can't see? Helen, the, the invite will go out on the Oh, it, it goes out to um, to everyone. To yeah. Everyone, so. yeah, it goes out to yeah. everyone. Um, bef before we, we finish this meeting, I just want to say at the next meeting, we have um, Councillor McCrossan and Councillor Wheeler coming. Um, now, they're going to be talking about, one of the things they would like to talk about is um, mental health of young people. Now, um, are you happy with that? And are there other areas you would like them to cover as well? Well, Rachel Ellis, I can see a physical hand for Rachel Ellis. <laughs> there we go. Uh, um, I mean, just thinking about the, the discussion we've had about antisocial behaviour, okay. um, which uh, I think it might be interesting that you know, in, in terms of young people, in terms of, of their behaviour, um, whether we could invite, well, both Councillor McCrossan and Councillor Wheeler to to comment on yeah. that and, and and how the borough might be able to, to support these young people into more positive behaviours. Yep, that's... Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I can and put that to. I will obviously email you as I usually do to see if anybody's got any specific issues, and I will send out the um, performance um, indicators for them to see what's happening. But um, yes, I can certainly include that. Um, yeah. that and, al yeah. and also just to note that um, when we had a discussion earlier, we're perhaps moving the complaints. Um, thing yeah. to the following meeting because the January meeting was getting a bit full. So we're we're going to move that forward. If you're looking at the plan. So uh, Jim's got a question. Yeah, James. I think you've just spoke my question. Actually, in one respect, I was just thinking <laughs> on that one. Would it be worth actually uh, having the police there, Inspector Pearson, and see how these how they're dealing with antisocial behaviour in various areas? Not a full report, but just something directly from them. Just an idea. But I think you've just ruled it out. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, no, no, we didn't rule it out. Or, or if we get, we're going to get some more information to be in the papers for next time about the sorts of antisocial behaviour and that all that type of thing. And then I don't, I don't know because I think that I think it would be too much to have somebody else here as well at the next meeting. But, but we um in the at the March meeting um. We will have a portfolio holder, but um, I know it's looking quite a way ahead. But if we have some um, information from Councillor Wheeler and Councillor McCrossan about antisocial behaviour and young people at the next meeting um, in the March, we could then discuss about having something further in the March meeting about antisocial behaviour. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, that's the only. Any... No, can't see any objections to no, that. No, that sounds great. Hang on. Get me my crib sheet back. So I think that's do we think that's everything about the work programme we need to talk about? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Happy with the work programme? Yep. And just check on the agenda. Um obviously the reports and notices, you can see that in the back of the report, very comprehensive. Um, information about why we haven't got all the all the quotes 
I think there was a couple of occasions, wasn't there? Or maybe even more than that. Three, was there? Yeah, I think there was three yeah. this time. Yeah. Three occasions all seemed very perfectly logical and self-explanatory to me. Um, I'm not seeing anybody saying anything. So I think um, I think that's all from me. It's been a very been a very interesting meeting with the uh, public protection and the temporary accommodation things. I think it's wow. been a very interesting meeting. Thank you, Chair. Is anybody else? Is, is that okay with everybody? No. Mm -hmm. I think I think we're done. Thank so you. Thanks, thanks to Helen as well for your. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody.